Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Well, Advent begins today. Thanksgiving has gone by and we begin a brand new church year. And the time for giving thanks for what we have has now sort of switched to compiling lists of things we do not have and that we want. The focus turns very rapidly from Thanksgiving to Black Friday sales and hunting for the best deals. And you may have already seen in the news there have been uh, people who camped out in line waiting at the stores and there have been quite literally fights over the latest deal on a flat screen television and even toilet paper packages. <laughs> now with this shopping frenzy, people are bound to ask you, are you ready? Are you ready for Christmas? And of course, what they mean by that is, have you done all your shopping? Do you have all your presents bought yet? Are your decorations up? Well, in today's gospel reading, we are also given this very same question. Are you ready? But of course, Jesus confronts us with something much more profound than the accumulation of more stuff. The question he asks has eternal consequences. And it's good to consider this since Advent is a time of preparation. It's a time when we prepare to celebrate the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ to that Bethlehem manger. And we also prepare for our, our Lord's second Advent, the day when he's going to return to judge the living and the dead. Now the first Sunday in Advent this year begins with a reading about Christ's return. And while it is clear that Jesus will return, we have no idea when. Concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. So with that in mind, you can be sure that anyone claiming to know the day when Jesus returns is a false prophet. They're either a liar or they're simply deluded. The important question is not, when will Jesus return? The question is, are you ready? Are you ready for the Lord's return? And Jesus makes it very clear in our gospel reading that many people will not be ready when he returns. He'll be taken very off guard. It was like in the days of, it'll be like in the days of Noah, Jesus tells us. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. Now, it isn't like the people in the area had no clue what was going, to, what was going on, because unlike those little cartoon drawings you see in the kids' Bibles, the ark wasn't this little cute uh, boat with a, you know, the giraffe's neck sticking out the window and the hippo taking up most of the upper deck. The ark was huge. There, it was about 450 feet long by 75 feet wide by 45 feet tall. Uh, there's a picture hanging in my office if you want to get kind of an artist's rendition of what the ark might have looked like. And that was the kind of project that people would have taken notice of. But they lived by sight and not by faith. They carried on with their busy lives disregarding the warnings of the Lord's coming judgment. Now, in his first letter, Peter writes that God was patient while Noah's ark was being built. And in Peter's second letter, Peter speaks of Noah as a preacher of righteousness. So people had plenty of time to hear God's word and repent, especially those in the immediate area. They could have boarded the ark, but they had better things to do. They wouldn't listen to Noah's witness about the coming judgment. So they lived in a spiritual fog until the day of judgment came and they were swept all away very suddenly. And it's no different today. There are plenty of churches where people can go to hear about the coming judgment, to hear about sin and the need for repentance and the forgiveness that is ours in Christ Jesus. And for people who don't make it to church, there is the messages out all over the internet and on the radio. 
But the world just kind of shrugs that off. Because the world would rather worry about more important things, like getting a flat screen TV at half price. So why concern yourself with the coming judgment? And there's plenty of time for that later, right? There's much better things to do right now. Very important things, things that are definitely uh, need my focus and time. Now, Jesus knows our tendency to focus on the things of this world at the expense of heavenly things. So he gives his followers a very stern warning that he will return. He makes it clear that no one knows when that's going to take place. He says that his return is going to be a shock for many people. In fact, the Lord even goes so far as to say it's going to be like a thief who breaks in in the middle of the night while the homeowner is fast asleep. Now, the Lord could return in five minutes or 500 years, but he will return suddenly, and many people are going to be caught off guard. Now, today's gospel reading is a warning to the disciples of Jesus. There's a real danger that the things of this world can dull our spiritual alertness. And you've probably seen this take place. It may have taken place in your life in the past. People who are Christians suddenly drift away from the Lord and from His church and they go their own way and they pursue the things of the earth. And eventually, as they're separated from God's Word and sacrament, they become very spiritually weak. It doesn't matter to them anymore if they receive the Lord's Supper. They don't set a time to hear and study the Word of God. In the process, they forget that Judgment Day is coming. They fall into a spiritual sleep. And none of us are immune to this temptation. Neither were the apostles. I mean, Jesus warned them over and over again about his sudden coming and to be ready. He's speaking to his followers in today's passage. He told the disciples in verse 44, You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So we need to remain vigilant while we wait for the Lord's return. Whenever He comes, we need to be prepared to receive Him. Now, today's reading seems like quite a burden because Jesus is calling on us to have this constant state of spiritual red alert. I mean, something that even the most devout and devoted Christian among us will fail at doing. And the apostles... They couldn't even stay awake in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus told them to. So there isn't a whole lot of gospel here in the gospel reading today. But if we step back for a moment and we look at the big picture, things will begin to brighten considerably. First, I want you to consider the title that Jesus uses in the reading from today. He calls himself the Son of Man. And by calling himself the Son of Man, Jesus reminds us that he is the long-awaited Savior the one who was prophesied in the Old Testament by the prophets. And he also reminds us that he is the promised one who came to save all of creation from sin. And how did he do that? Well, he took on flesh in the womb of the Virgin Mary. And he was born and he shed his real human blood on the cross and suffered a human death in our place. The very Son of God humbled himself and became the Son of Man in order to save us. Second, let's consider Paul's exhortation in the epistle reading. He says to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. As God's children, we are to cast off the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. And that is exactly what happened to you on your baptism day. Because as the water poured over you, your sins, your deeds of darkness were nailed to the cross with Jesus. You were buried with Him and raised, rose to new life. And you put on the armor of light, the righteousness of Christ. Paul writes in Galatians 3.27, For as many of you who are baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So, if you've been doing deeds of darkness leading up into Advent, there are things in your life that are contrary to the Word of God and what His will is for you. 
Heed the words of Paul. This Advent season, cast off those deeds of darkness and return to your baptism. Put on the armor of light. Put on Jesus, who covers your sin with his perfect, sinless light. And finally, consider the wonders that are in store for you when our Lord returns in glory. For those who are baptized and who trust in Jesus, it's not a time of terror. It's a time of tremendous joy. Because that's the moment when all of your struggles, all of your fight against sin, all your doubts will come to a very sudden end. And it's the moment when you're going to get to be with the Lord in paradise. It's the moment when you're going to get to fully experience the love and the care that the Lord has for you. And you're going to get to experience it with all of your departed loved ones who have died in the faith. So as you begin these frenzied preparations for Christmas, as you run around getting everything ready for the big day, remember that Advent is a time of spiritual preparation. It's a special time when we prepare for the coming of Jesus. We prepare to celebrate the birth of Jesus in that Bethlehem manger long ago, a birth so that he could grow up and suffer and die on the cross for our sins. And we prepare for his second Advent on the last day, the day when all of creation will be restored fully. And while we wait for the Lord to return in glory, we prepare, along with all these excited confirmation students, to receive Jesus in the sacrament of the altar. The Lord comes to you today with forgiveness and salvation. These children have prepared. There you have wonderful statements of faith in the bulletin, in the back of the bulletin that you can read for yourself. So prepare with them. Prepare to receive your Lord with the joy and gladness. A peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.